Now, just in case you haven't been paying attention, the theater of the absurd continues to sponsor performances. <laughs> Regretfully, this week, perhaps the most amazing to me was we celebrated National Women's Day. I hope you caught it. The Woman of Courage Award was presented by our first lady to a biological male. You have to think about that a little bit because it is irrational and illogical. It is the fulfillment of what we were reading in Revelation 22. And the whole, organ, the, the whole exercise was conducted with straight faces and cameras rolling and narratives being provided. We, the only thing that was missing was the little boy to say that the emperor had no clothes. On a bit more troubling note, the Arizona School Board and Arizona School Board this week voted. I don't know if you read it. It was distressful. It, 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 it created some emotion in me for more than one day. They voted to stop allowing students, teachers from a local Christian university. They had a five-year contract. It wasn't that the students had misbehaved or broken protocol. Members of the school board said that the, they went and looked at the university's website and they said they intended to, to lift up the name of Jesus. And they said that was problematic, that it would make the schools where those teachers were being engaged with children not safe. So the school board members broke the contract. The last thing they wanted was student teachers from a Christian university engaging with the children because it would make them less safe. You had to read on to get the, the full weight of what was happening. The school board member who brought the opinion and started the discussion identified those Christian students as dangerous. But she describes herself on the district's website in this way, and I quote, a bilingual, disabled, neurodivergent, queer black Latina who loves a good hot wing, but only with the right ranch and things that sparkle. This is also included in her bio. She frequently wears cat ears. But Christian students shouldn't be available in our schools because they're dangerous. Folks, you couldn't make statements about almost any group of our society like they make about Christians. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to be violent. I don't want you to be belligerent, but I would encourage you to wake up. You better take your faith with you. You better take your faith with you to work. You better take it with you when you take your children to school. And anybody that tells you it's not welcome, I, you need to get them to explain to you why that's the case, because there are all sorts of worldviews and ideologies and moral perspectives that are being pushed into the public square and the corporate boardroom and the corridors of our hospitals. And I will not relinquish the privilege of sharing our Christian faith. Don't wait. Do not wait. We've tried being tolerant and kind and retiring. Again, I don't want you to be angry and belligerent, but you've got to be awake. Christians aren't perfect. No group is perfect. But the worldview we hold has a legitimate right in the public square. Now, how have we arrived at this place? It isn't because evil has pushed us out. We have arrived here because the church has withdrawn. We've given our hearts to other things. We've given our passions to other things. We've wanted our children to be identified in other ways than as Christ followers first. We didn't want them to have the stigma of being one of those people. So it really is about vision and what we understand the role of our faith to be. Look at Proverbs 29 and verse 18. It says, where there is no revelation, it, it could be translated either way, le equally legitimately. It could be that where there is no revelation, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. <laughs> when the preaching's so hot, it sets off alarms. 
where there is no revelation or vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Hebrew poetry is written in couplets. You need both ideas to get the full meaning. So when it says there is no revelation or vision, the people refuse any restraint. The alternative, the rest of the story is those who keep the law. You see, when we reject a God perspective, we will cast off increasingly any restraint. There are no boundaries. There are no limits. Anything quite literally goes. And then the greatest threat becomes anyone who would bring a God perspective back into the discussion because it's seen as limiting, diminishing. I've told you many times one of the great lies that has settled upon this generation is that honoring Jesus will diminish your life. It is not true. The truth of Jesus brings freedom to every human life. Darkness brings bondage. Darkness will break you down physically. Jesus is a healer. And the church has got to be awakened. How many seminars is the church going to sponsor on whether God still heals or God still does miracles? Well, we step back from the power of the one who died for us. Where there is no vision, we cast off restraint. We have to have the awareness, the revelation that honoring God brings life and health and fulfillment and contentment. You can't secure your future apart from God. What a myth. Look at Exodus 32. This lives so real in our hearts. It's so close to us. This isn't about someone else or some other generation. Exodus 32, it's the Exodus generation. These are the people that begin as slaves in Egypt. Moshe, Moses walks in out of the desert and says, we're leaving. And there's a little bit of a dust up. When Moses has gone up Mount Sinai, the people lose their balance and it's a consistent tug of war in their hearts. In chapter 32, it says, Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the Levites rallied to him. I read that not to make fun of or to highlight the inconsistencies of the Exodus generation. I read that so that you understand this is a challenge in every generation. Yielding to the Lord, accepting the restraint of God's truth, You see, your carnal nature and mine says, I think and I feel and I want and I will not be restrained. And the new birth, conversion, salvation does not diminish the intensity of that carnal nature. It introduces a new authority so that sin is no longer your master. But we face the challenge of it and we have to put to death that old carnal nature. Which means we have to be willing to speak the truth to one another, to lift up God's truth, to be willing to say that godliness and holiness and purity are legitimate goals and objectives. They're more valuable than anything else. They're more valuable than any achievement, anything we accumulate, any degree we earn, any resource that we accumulate. Honoring Lord and walking uprightly before the Lord has value, church. We've got to be willing to say that again. Amos, the prophet Amos, he's a farmer. Isaiah is a functionary of the court. Isaiah, and I don't mean that in a a derogatory way, but Isaiah was very comfortable with the intrigue of the palace. He's a court prophet. Isaiah spoke to kings and leaders of nations, and they sought his counsel when the pressure was great enough. Amos is a farmer. He's a simple man. And Amos says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Again, what we're witnessing is not something new. It's so easy to to get excited. You know, we're the terminal generation. We're the ones standing at the end of the ages. And it it could be. But the characteristics of the world we're standing in have been repeated over and over and over again. The question of that terminal generation will be a a question of, of magnitude and scope. And we're too early in the process to know that. 
We don't know how far the disease process will go. But in the meantime, we have the assignment of holding up the light, of lifting up the name of Jesus. It's going to require of us the courage to lead. We've lacked this. We've wanted the courage to be born again. We've wanted the courage perhaps to go to church. We wanted the courage to be polite. But we certainly didn't want to have to be. And leadership is influence. Leadership is not a title. It's not a position. It's not a nameplate. You've all known people. I've known people that had titles and positions that said they were leaders and people could have cared less about their opinions. Unfortunately, they're usually the last one to know. But, but ultimately, leadership is about influence. And what we've been called to do is influence the world in which we live, the places where we have been given an opportunity, a sphere of influence, where people's opinions when they care about your opinion, when they will listen to what you have to say, if they will accept your professional advice, your faith needs to roll into that. If they care about what you think about their fantasy sports teams, your faith life better roll into that. If they care about your opinions on restaurants or where to recreate or where to vacation, your faith life better roll into that. Do we have the courage to be an influence? Or do you think you've hired me to do that? I'm asked with some frequency these days if I'm afraid, if there are threats. May I ask you that question? Is your faith a public enough part of who you are when you, in your professional arena? Does it frighten you that you're going to forfeit opportunities or you'll be censored or you will in some way, there's a possibility of some pushback? In your friend group, are, are you concerned you're going to be left off an invitation list or you're going to be in some way excluded? Are we leading with our faith? Folks, this is a very important question. Amen. One of the classic examples in all of Scripture is the handoff between Moses and Joshua. Moses, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, is the leader par excellence. When we get to the New Testament and the Jesus narrative, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews goes way out of his way to demonstrate to the reader that Jesus was more faithful than Moses. Because for hundreds of years, there was nobody more faithful than Moses. And Moses didn't lead the people into the promised land. Joshua, that assignment fell to him. So in Deuteronomy 31, Moses is preparing Joshua and he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. What's the problem? Lots of terror. Big enemies, powerful enemies. The odds aren't great. We're weak. We don't have the resources. The Lord will go with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous. You must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. There's the theme emerging. What's necessary to have the courage to be an influence, the courage to lead? It's going to take strength and courage. Who knew? That's not what our churches have been cranking out. I've spent my life in the church world. We've learned Isaiah's middle name. We've learned original languages. We've learned how to spell the 12 tribes in Hebrew letters. I'm not opposed to those things. I like to learn. I'm all for learning, but I want to grow in strength in the Lord and the courage to believe him. It's repeated in chapter 31 of Deuteronomy again in verse 23. Be strong and courageous. It's a commandment again. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 5. This is God's promise to Joshua. Moses is gone now. Whew. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you'll lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. You'll be successful wherever you go. Don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. 
so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Makes you think Joshua's from the slow group. (laughs) Seven times from Moses to God, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. What's he struggling with? Terror and discouragement. Moses couldn't get him in. Moses and that staff, I mean, they parted the Red Sea, water from a rock, manna on the ground, 10 commandments down the mountain. The earth opened up and swallowed the complaint line. But Moses couldn't lead the people. He couldn't influence them in. He couldn't silence the dissent. He couldn't tap down the complaints. So for 40 years, we've wandered in the desert and now Moses is gone. This is frightening. Have you seen Jericho? And God said, be strong and courageous. Look, we see expressions of darkness. We can gather in our church and talk about what we see happening. But the reason we're silent is we understand the forces arrayed against us. If we don't understand it consciously, we understand it subconsciously. So we're polite. We don't want to poke the bear. There's a cost of leadership. Let me say it a different way. There's a cost to use your faith as a point of influence. We got to just say this out loud. There is. You can cheer for professional athletes. You can be for professional sports. You can invest in the food network. There's lots of things you can do. You can develop your hobby. You can be accepted into all sorts of places. But you bring your faith out and say, I will allow myself to be identified with this set of principles. That's our future. Or the lack thereof. Paul in Philippians chapter 3. He said, whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. Paul had a brilliant education. He had some of the finest training of his generation. His future was written. He'd, he'd, He'd made the sacrifices to put his education in place. And he had matched it with a zeal that had forced him to the top of his peer group. He was a leader in the city of Jerusalem to the point that his effectiveness was so great, they began to dismiss him to go to the cities of the surrounding region. And on the way to Damascus, he had an encounter with a rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus. And he said, just exactly what is it you're doing? And Paul, a clever man, said, who are you, Lord? And his life made a 180 degree change. And so now he's writing to a church in Philippi. He said, whatever was to my profit, I consider a loss for the sake of Christ. I walked away from a career, a profession, accolades, affirmation. I was used to seats of honor and professional acknowledgement. And I consider it a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Do you think that was easier for Paul to say than for you or me? I don't. I read that and I think, what has he done? What has he focused his mind on? What has he given his emotions to that he could look at the professional ladder that his peer group is climbing so feverishly and he said, I consider it rubbish. Something happened in him. We haven't even talked about this. We haven't treated this like it was an objective. We just think it happened to him. You know, I find that we impute to other people that that it's easier for them. Oh, they just like being godly. Fasting is easier to them. They just don't enjoy food as much as I do. (laughs) Whatever it is, you know, you you meet skinny people and you think, oh, they just have better metabolism. Yeah, it's because they're at the gym at four o'clock, running like a hamster on a treadmill. (laughs) 
I'm at the donut shop ordering three fritters because I'm going to share a fourth of one of them. And we have that same attitude towards our faith. Well, it's just they like to read their Bible. No. They may have learned to like it. But listen to what he said. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So we cheap it and say, oh, it's a gift. Just receive the free gift. You're absolutely right. Salvation is a gift. But a life of faith is built one decision at a time, one day at a time. That's our reality. How have we arrived at a church that is inert, inept, easily swept aside, declared insignificant, non-essential? In 2 Corinthians, this is still Paul, 11. He said, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked and besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That's how he got there. Day after day, week after week, month after month, he said, I'll do what it takes. I'm going to go tell a Jesus story. I'll tell it where it's welcome. I'll tell it where it's not. I'll tell it when there's applause and I'll tell the story when it means there's going to be imprisonment. He said, I know what it is. He's put an invitation in front of us, folks. I don't know all that the future holds. I have some ideas and I have some little windows into some snippets of it, but I can tell you this, it's going to require of us a different response than who we have been in the past. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.